because it's psychology, psychology, psychology. You know? Two traders, Darren and Walter, pull back the curtain on profitable trading systems, consistent money management, and profitable psychological triggers. Welcome to the Two Traders Podcast. Welcome back to the Two Traders Podcast. In part two, you're going to hear Darren and I dig into the trader that could never lose, the hive mind, the psychology of predicting the future and what this means for traders, and including information about the trader who could never lose. All of this and more in today's episode of the Two Traders Podcast. So the other thing I want to talk about, because I knew we, I knew we would end up talking about this idea that the entry doesn't really matter. You can take random entries, and as long as you're consistently applying a high reward to risk ratio, so a hot, basically looking for big profits, it can work out for you. Even though it's painful, and a lot of traders don't want to do that. Maybe a lot of traders don't want to take a really, really, really tiny, small amount of risk. Because if you think about it. If you're going for 10R and you're going to have 77 losing trades in a row, you know, you've got to you've really got to have a really small amount at risk, don't you, in order to to you know, to keep going, I suppose. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So so that, that that's one way where you can make this work for you is just that's one lesson here, right? Just to reduce your if you're used to risking 2% what if you risk a quarter of a percent? Yeah, I think, again, that that is another one of the main barriers is a lot of traders are starting out with small accounts and they want to grow them you know, aggressively. And so we tend to risk more than is right for the system we're trading. So then, you know, you alter the system rather than altering the amount that you're risking. I did do, I, I was having a dig around on the internet yesterday for... For this, because I was thinking about this exact thing and about specifically greed, you know, and how greed manifests itself in our trading. It's quite hard to get any really good information on it, but I think you know that that is something that is a problem as well. We want to, you know, we want to make insane returns, um, but we're not prepared for the downsides of that. Yeah, it's impatience, isn't it? I want to leave my job. I want to grow this account to ten million dollars. I know. I want to. I want. It's sort of. I often ask traders, "Why do you want to trade the one-hour charts?" And they'll say, "Well, I need to have more trading opportunities." I mean, it it literally comes down to that. They don't want to trade the four-hour, the daily, or the weekly. They want to trade the one-hour because they want to have more trades. And while it's true, it's true that you'll you'll cycle through. You know, you'll you'll cycle through your statistics faster if you have more trades, but it's not the only way to do it. You can add more systems, you can add more markets, you don't have to necessarily do that. And for those traders who have to sit there and watch it, like this strategy that we're talking about here, presumably, you know, the trade is either going to hit the five R or the ten R target, or it's going to get stopped out, right? I mean, is that is that are those the only yeah, so it's either hit, hit target or hit stop. So there isn't really much to watch or do there. But for a lot of systems, traders feel like they need to watch it, analyze it, and reassess and, and do something. So in that case, you know, you're stuck to the computer screen, really. It's it's just another job. What would you I mean, how like did you when you first started trading, you weren't did you look at it from the I need to predict the market p- point of view and, and and slowly come around to this other style of trading yeah definitely that's that's exactly what i did i did multi time frame i had four four charts for every instrument uh on four different time frames and i was working out the exact point that it was going to turn around <laughs> and the exact point to get out again and that was all my work and you know sunday night i did loads loads of and then i went on to sort of like the monthly and weekly to work out what was going on and you know the the funny thing is, is um, I could go back to that system now and trade it really well because I just hold on to my winners a bit longer. Because what happens is when you've had two losers on the trot on the next one, your mind's starting to see things that aren't really there. And it's saying, oh, that's definitely um, some resistance there. And oh, that that candle pattern saying that it's reversing here because, you know, fear increases. And you, you know, you start to see things that in a different way. I mean, if you if you study how we look at things and how we make our decisions, how the whole brain thing works, then it's fairly obvious that that approach has got a lot of flaws in it. And, you know, you're probably uh, an advantage to at least simplify it and or reduce the amount of, 
of yeah. it that you're doing. You know? Yeah, no, I agree. So, so I mean, we both kind of agree that it's true that you don't have to predict the markets to make money. It's it's just it's not it's not critical, and it's 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 kind of a sign of of your stage. When I first started getting into trading, all I really cared about was trying to crack the GAN code. So traders who've who've looked at W D GAN, you know they you know this idea that he supposedly th- there was a, a journalist from the New York Times who followed him around and. And over the course of a month or five weeks or something like that, saw all 27 trades he took and they all made money except one or something like that. And he supposedly had cracked the harmonics of the universe. So I was really interested in that when I first started trading and really studying it before I came to the point of, you know, just looking for other things, just looking for other reasons. And I, you know, I think you can look at, you don't have to look at the market and say, well, I think it's going to do this or, you know, I, I know the market's going to do this or whatever. I think you can still trade the market from a probabilistic point of view. So you could say like, let's say that you're looking at a market and it's trending up. Well, you could say, well, if it does this, you know, if it pulls back like this and then does that, then I think it's going to keep going higher and, and it's going to keep trending up. The trend's intact. But if it does this, well, maybe I'd be looking for it to fall and, and, and maybe I'll short it. Maybe the trend is over. And like you can look at it from that point of view too. You don't have to just say, well, throw your hands up and say, well, I'll just flip a coin or whatever. You don't have to do that. You, it doesn't have to be that extreme. But just having that other side and just thinking, okay, I want to go long the euro right here. Who's looking at the same chart thinking that they want to go short? Why do they see, like, who's on the other side of my trade here? What's going on? Right? I think that's really health, yeah. healthy to do. I, 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 I definitely think, you know, I, I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, you can add an edge to your trading through some sort of analysis. But I think the problem is that people think that that is the only thing and that is the most important thing. And that's where the danger is. You have to accept that there's there's other important elements and some of them may be more important than that analysis it's keeping it in context isn't it exactly yeah that's right that's right so we've basically established that that's the case you don't have to predict the markets to pull money out of the markets it's not that critical however i want to get i want to get some of your ideas on some of these things that 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 have come up because I think they're fascinating, and like I said, while I don't think they're they're critical to your arsenal as a trader, I do find them interesting, and I wonder what the future holds. So I have a couple of exhibits here. Okay, so exhibit A, Darren, is that we have some data from psychology that suggests that humans have some bit of premonition. Okay, so we have there's this premonition out there where the classic example, and I can post some of these studies in the show notes for this episode, but the classic is where someone's sitting in front of a computer and they're shown some images. And you might be shown an image like a bunny rabbit or a butterfly or some flowers. And then maybe you'll see like, you know, some scary skeleton or a gun pointed at you, you know, that looks like it's pointed at you or something like that. And so what they found is that people actually anticipate the scary image and before they're shown the image, they seem to know physiologically that they're going to be presented with this scary image. So while they're randomly interspersed in the slide deck, they seem to know before it happens. Now, there's really no explanation for this other than to say that, well, it seems like somehow people are aware of something happening before it happens, which is fascinating, right? So what, what do you think about that? Um, I believe that I've seen similar research from neuroscientists that suggest that that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, does it mean that people are predicting the future? Because that's the kind of the simplest explanation here is that people are aware, somehow aware of what's going to happen before it happens. Yes, possibly. I mean, um, <laughs> I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to get you to squirm, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, can I make money out? Of it, no, yeah, no. I, I, I'm not saying that. It's a separate issue. I, t- I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. I'm just saying that there is there an element of of humanness. Do we have something as humans that? allows us to somehow anticipate the future. I'm not saying it's necessary. I'm not saying it's critical. I'm not saying it's something a trader must have. I'm just saying 
maybe we do have this as humans. Yeah, I think certainly the brain can do some amazing things that we are just finding out about and we probably don't know how to harness them. But maybe on a subconscious level, we are harnessing them, you know. Yeah. You don't know what your next thought's going to be. Yeah. You can never predict that, you know. So our conscious and our subconscious, there's two separate things going on there. And I'm kind of getting into waters. (laughs) No, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, you know, yeah, definitely there's some fascinating stuff going on there. And I like Denise Scholl's work where she's kind of worked on this kind of proof that you can, you know, read what other people are going to do. There's like a skill for predicting what other humans are going to do. And obviously that's strongly connected with what we're doing as traders. Is that like, are you talking about like cold reading? Like when you go to a, a palm palmist and they, the palm reader basically sizes you up really quickly and tries to get information from you and then tells you the same information in another way or something? Is that what you mean or is that something different? Well, she kind of goes into your fractal psychology. So she works out right. basically what's driving your decisions from your past. It's like things that have happened in your past and they're driving your decisions. And she kind of highlights this to the traders she works with and 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 says you know kind of by highlighting these things they kind of start to look at the charts in a different way and then see improvement in their performance because just from being aware of of how they're making decisions basically so okay so so that's exhibit a the other one i want to talk about um because I think this is fascinating, is this idea that instead of individuals having some sort of premonition or ability to anticipate the future, there's this idea that it's kind of like this hive mind where all of humanity as a whole, if you look at them, they can and they are aware of future events, particularly major future events, and that th- this is reflected in their language. So there's a guy that's a, a programmer, a, 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 by all indications, a brilliant programmer. And what he's created are these little robots that kind of crawl around the internet, especially in social media. And it picks up information from the internet. And what he's trying to do is piece together the, crit, the, the most important language patterns because he uses these to say, well, this is what's going to happen, you know, three months, six months, a year from now based on this, on this language. So he starts with the presupposition that humans have this ability to tell the future, to, to know what the future is going to be. It's kind of like the future is a a pebble dropped in, in the pond and the ripples are coming towards us before we actually get to the pebble. We're getting these ripples, right? So, the way that this works, as best I understand it, and I'll, I'll link up his work in the show notes here because it's absolutely fascinating. And I first was turned on to this in May or June of 2008 because he was talking about this major event that was going to occur in September, early September 2008, and it was going to have a name. People would refer to it. It would affect the fi- especially the financial markets and all this stuff, right? And this is what he had determined through the language patterns. And so, for example, you might say something, Darren, you might say, um, you could say something like, uh, if I was to ask you, hey, how's your trade going? Or how's your trading going? You might say, oh, it's going pretty well. And I'm working on a new exit strategy. And it it looks promising. Or you might say something like, so that would be one way of saying it. Or you might say something like, which there's not a lot of emotion attached to that, right? But but you could also say something like this. You could say, wow, it's amazing. I'm very excited about this new exit strategy. I just made 20R yesterday. Okay, so there's a little bit more emotion attached to that. And then if I asked you the same question, you might say something like this. <laughs> this bloody thing's going <laughs> to... You could say... This bloody thing, this bloody thing's gonna make me so much damn money. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna retire to uh, Monaco tomorrow or something like that, right? So there's three. I mean, it's all the same question. It's all the same answer, really. But it, there's more emotion attached to the third one than there is to the first one. So that's what he, this guy looks at, and he and he puts out all of these uh, reports where he's trying to distill 
what are the most important things? And one of the things he's been talking about forever, for years and years, is Bitcoin and how this was going to be the year, uh, 2017 was going to be the year of Bitcoin and blah, 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 and all this stuff. Anyway, I just find it fascinating, this idea that humans are in their language, almost like leaking out their knowledge of the future. That he's essentially collecting all these data through his programs and assimilating it in, in, into the way that he views the world. And I just thought it was fascinating. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, wow. Well, uh yeah, it's pretty amazing. I did hear, like, there was some guys, some university guys in England who did something similar with Twitter. They had, like, an algorithm that that took all of the tweets with regards to the financial markets and then crunched them up and, and could predict, you know, what was going to happen in, in the stock market or the currency markets. And they did um, a, a similar thing. I don't know, is it kind of like a really intense, like fundamental analysis, is it? I guess you could say that. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't talk about it that way, and he's not a, even really a trader. He talks a lot about social trends and political events and things like that. You know, it's not just financial markets, although it, that obviously comes up from time to time. And this guy is, I think he's largely self-taught. He lives like in a van in the woods. <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? Like he's this really reclusive very eccentric dude but he's clearly very smart and he says that like some of the like you were saying twitter he definitely his web crawlers will pull information off twitter he says he gets brilliant stuff from snapchat he goes you wouldn't believe the kind of information i get from snapchat you know it's just really fascinating to hear this and he's pretty old like he's been around for a long time he's consulted for companies like google and microsoft and stuff like that he's a really good programmer you know he's like top-notch dude but i just find it fascinating this idea that the way i see it and he explains it i'm sure better than i do but you can you can read up more about it in the show notes he has tons and tons of videos on youtube for people who are interested but the way he explains it is basically we're kind of like leaking out our knowledge of the future by the by the words that we use and the way that we use them the emotion that we attach so the more emotional we are with certain words it means that the that the that the event is closer right whereas if there's just a little bit of emotion here it's it's further out that's how he kind of hones in on it i mean that's that's quite in, you know it kind of comes back to the original question really where trends cultural trends are evolving but we're not kind of predetermining what those trends are going to be they just kind of evolve yeah but then when, like if you look at through through Taleb's point of view we look back and we say well we saw that Hitler was coming or whatever you know we we look back with hindsight and we say oh but that was a, that was the slow rise of Hitler like that was obvious or that yeah. was the slow yeah. march to World War II or whatever it is you know we look back and we and we kind of color it another way and say well that was you know you could kind of see the rise of you know Donald Trump or whatever you know what I mean like yeah well that's may you know that's maybe why we buy into this being able to predict trends because when we do look back it looks so obvious well you know we must be able to predict them in the future but it, it doesn't necessarily work out that way does it absolutely so you know yeah. you might be better off just participating and making the most out of them that, that you can yeah exactly yeah yeah. I mean, I think it's fun to look at that kind of stuff and, you know, and trying to predict the future, but I think it's, it's more helpful to look in terms, you know, look at things in terms of probabilities, really. And so, and if your data tells you that you're going to more likely to make money if you have a 10 R exit and a random, randomly assigned bullish and bearish days, then go for it. You know what I mean? But you might feel more comfortable splitting it up. Maybe you have a five R, you use that strategy with a five R target and you use the same strategy with a 10 R target. That's yeah, that's ex exactly what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, I did for the last <laughs> three months. I take um, two positions on exactly the same entry and one I I have a five R target and the other one is, is a 10 R target. And I'm even at the moment looking at adding a one-to-one -one R target off the same entry. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. And it isn't all about making more money and, and just about trying to diversify risk, you know. There's the psychological things, even if you understand the psychology of going through, um, you know, long runs of losers or drawdowns, it makes it slightly easier to deal with, but you're still going to feel uncomfortable there. And, you know, I've touched on this 
quite a lot in the past. You know, the things that I add to my strategies now tend to be things just to make it a bit more comfortable. And I might even add something that's going to make me less money, but make the whole long process of it more comfortable for me to deal with. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Because because you're trying to set yourself up for long-term success. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I want to enjoy it as well. I don't want to be in pain every day whilst I'm exactly. achieving it. And so if you believe the 20 period moving average is the one and your testing shows that the 50 period moving average is slightly better still nothing wrong with using you know the the 20 because it's psychology 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 yeah absolutely yeah yeah i agree i mean that's that's why i think you know when you when you have a trailing exit and a target like if you split your your trade up to a trailing exit and a target two different positions it's not because you're going to make more money it's just because you want you want to have those trades that don't make a lot of money on the trailing exit but but do okay on the target you want to have those so that you feel psychologically like you did like oh, that was a good trade you know even though you're better off probably using the almost always using the trailing exit on all of your positions but it's just painful to have so many of those those trailing exit trades you know give back so much profit and 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 not do well and now i i i've seen you post about that loads in the past and i never i always resisted that idea i always resisted it and you know with time i've kind of like you know i see what you're talking about now and you know at the time i I just wanted to be the best right if that's not the best right if that's not the best return i'm not going to do it i'm going to do what's the best return um, you know, but then you're more likely to make mistakes and, you know, give money back in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Darren, this has been a fascinating discussion and I appreciate your your thoughts on prediction. This is an uh, interesting, interesting uh, podcast uh, or the last two podcasts, I should say, part one and part two. Thanks a lot for your time. Likewise, Walter, and uh, Happy New Year, mate. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. See you, see you next time. Okay, bye, Walter. Bye.